for our academies. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, the Zoom, please look around your screen. There's several different uh, options. Uh, and uh, we're going to be taking questions during the presentation and afterwards. In order to uh, ask a question, we ask you to do a couple of things. Uh, uh, we ask you to either uh, click on either the participants and or the uh, chat. Uh, if you click on participants in the lower left hand uh, portion of that screen, you'll see a, a blue raise hand. If you raise the hand, I will uh, either myself or Brian will acknowledge you and say, wait one before you turn your microphone on and we'll interrupt Rich when it's appropriate. There's also an area in the uh, uh, ch that says chat at the bottom and that way you can see conversations that are going on in the background so we don't interrupt uh, Rich uh, with uh, information and uh, with that I will be, I will be posting uh, one uh, for sale item that we have uh, for this uh, D it's a DMR radio and any tone and the specifics there will be posted in uh, for everyone to see. If you're interested, you can give me a call. My contact information is there. Um, Rich has said that if you have questions uh, and you want to get back to a slide, uh, make write down the uh, title of the slide and then he can go back to uh, that particular slide uh, at the end of the presentation or whenever we get to interrupt him. Uh, please wait to be recognized before you start speaking and we'll say turn on your microphone and then uh, when you finish, turn it off. If you do the raise hand bit, uh, you're going to have to click on it a second time once you've been acknowledged so that you turn that icon off. Um, and uh, any comments from Rich or uh, any other presenters, Mike Moore might be kibitzing in and Steve Verzuli. They're co-presenters with this. Uh, they're doing uh, other parts of the digital and have information on uh, uh, this topic as well. So uh, I think that's all my notes here. Um, that's, yeah, all right. So Rich, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, you can begin and thank you very much for putting the time in and presenting this to our Academy uh, watchers here. All right. Thank you, Tim, and thanks for having me. So I'd like to thank uh, Mike and Steve also uh, for adding me to the team. I saw their video. I was just getting into ham radio when they did their presentation a couple of years ago, back in September of 2018, on all these three topics. Uh, it's nice that we split it out because these, these three uh, digital radios have so much to cover to get a real good in-depth uh, and putting it in two hours is, is just a shame. So it's really great to, to open these things up. All right, so little introduction here. Rich Hoffarth, K2AXP. AXP, that's my fraternity at college. Uh, as soon as I got my tech, I was lucky enough to put in for a vanity and this came up and so here I am. Uh, so, I've I just got my license back in 2018, the tech, and then the November general. Uh, but I really have always had a connection with shortwave and uh, ham radio. My dad used to have this old Zenith radio when we were kids. I remember like four or five years old, turning knobs and things, not knowing what was going on. Later on in uh, in school, maybe like uh, fourth or fifth grade, he got me this uh, Heathkit EK2 shortwave receiver. Uh, which I built, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, let's see, so now I have an AnyTone that I got for Christmas right after I got involved. Uh, I've also been to Clarkson University, electrical and computer engineering degree, and I've uh, been computer programmer for 35 years, so that's probably why I'm hooked so much on digital, because it's, uh, it's related to the computer, a lot of computer stuff. So... See, oh, and uh, so I start when I started out about in January is when I really started digging in to get online with my radio, and it took me a good part of the month to figure everything out. And, and boy, it was confusing terms and getting things mixed up, and not everything is correct on the net. You get bad information, things are changing over the years. 
So I'm hoping that uh, this presentation is really going to help people understand DMR radio. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, talk about these three main layers to the system. There's the network layer, which is owned by Brandmeister and their servers, and these are the servers that connect to the repeaters as part of the uh, ongoing system. And then there's the web servers that we're also going to go out and visit. Uh, we're going to talk about some talk groups. We'll get right in talking about them because they're pretty pivotal to the whole system. Uh, next, we're going to drop down into the second layer I call the link layer, which is how you get into the system. It's composed of repeaters and hotspots, and they connect to the master servers at the network level, and then they also connect from your radio using RF. And so we're going to spend a little time talking about that layer. And then finally, we're going to get to the radio layer, which, of course, is a layer most people start out with, and that's why it's so confusing because you're starting at the bottom of this pyramid and having to associate so much information. Uh, so radios, really three key components. There's the hardware part, there's the firmware, which are the instructions to run the radio, and then there's the infamous code plug, which is really the configuration information for the radio. And you think it'd be a piece of cake, but that code plug is about two megabytes, so there's a lot of information in there and a lot of uh, ways to program it and strategies, so we're gonna try and cover all those areas to help people out. Finally, hopefully, we'll get into some operations. All right, so it's just some quick history on DMR. Uh, stands for Digital Mobile Radio. Uh, the first spec came out of Europe in 2005. Uh, it has a commercial background. It was a commercial radio. Uh, ham radio operators adopted it. And so... There are some features on there you're going to find that really don't make sense, and that's because they have a commercial background. There's some things like encryption that aren't even allowed in ham radio, so you shouldn't even be using some of those features. So we won't even talk about those features, but if we have a questions, it might just be the answer is, you know, uh, I don't know why they would have that feature for ham radio, and the answer would be it's, a, it's for the commercial background. So DMR takes up uh, 12 and a half megahertz. So it's a narrow band FM. Uh, it uses two time slots, uh, TDMA, which is your time domain multiple access. Uh, P25 also uses this uh, encoding technique uh, for their radios. And what the radio does is it uh, transmits for a short time. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe like 80, 100 milliseconds, and then it listens back for that time slot and that transmits on time slot two and then it listens on time slot two and then it goes back to time slot one then time slot two and on and on. Uh, other radios might use frequency so they might have two uh, frequencies at uh, six and a quarter kilo megahertz uh, uh, to, to do their scheming. Uh, two of the big names in DMR is DMR Mark which is a, a big network that was uh, initially a very popular, and then Brandmeister, which is a more uh, newer one and, and a little more popular these days. Okay, so here's my pyramid. Uh, so I always like to have a good picture to help me visualize how the system works and goes together. And so this is one of the first diagrams to help people. Uh, and it shows the network layer on the top with the network servers, link layer, and radios. And off to the side here, we have some of the main components of that. So at the network layer, we're really dealing with radio IDs. So that's the ID that makes your radio unique and can be connected to in a uh, conversation. And then there are talk groups. And talk groups are just a way for people to communicate. And we'll uh, roll into those in a minute. Link layer, you get into the ID for the repeater or the hotspot. Of course, you get your transmit and receive frequencies. You have your color code, which is just another form of, uh, of uh, your uh, PL tones, uh, CCS. Uh, and uh, so if it's uh, crowded, uh, people use color tones to separate out, separate out, talk to the different uh, repeaters. Then you've got to be conscious of your time slots when you're working at the repeater layer or the hotspot layer. Rich, uh, yes. one, one comment. So you mentioned the uh, spacing was 12 point. 
uh, 12 and a half megahertz, I believe oh. it's kilohertz. Okay, thank you. I'll have to update that slide. Uh, and then there's the radios. So when you're talking about radios, you're talking about channels, uh, zones, which is a way to group the channels. A scan list is a way to control when you want the scan feature on the radio, and then there's receive groups. So we're gonna try and go through this using the onion technique uh, in two ways. We're gonna start at the network layer, and we're gonna just talk about talk groups and radio IDs. And then we're gonna go into the link layer and pick up more terms. And then finally, when we get to radios, we're gonna be at the bottom and we're gonna be talking about all those terms higher up plus along with the radio parameters. And also we're gonna use the onion technique in that we're gonna go through all these layers and in each layer, we're gonna talk about some things over and over again. So talk groups, we're gonna talk about talk groups at the network layer, the link layer, and the radio layer. And there'll all be different aspects of that. And I think that'll be easier to understand rather than just talk for 20 minutes on talk groups and throw everything out to you. All right, let's move on. So uh, as far as DMR, radio and the standard, there are multiple networks out there that uh, use DMR radio. So Brandmeister is one of the more popular ones. DMR Mark is another one uh, supported by Motorola. There's another DMR Plus uh, that's kind of connected in with DMR Mark now. Uh, there's other more localized ones like Rocky Mountain Ham Radio, which is a group in Colorado and actually spills out into outlying states. And they have their own kind of private network. They have their own microwave a repeater system they put in place so that they're not relying on the regular uh, internet connections through your ISPs. They provide their own background and they use that for a lot of their weather issues and uh, storms and snow and out there in, in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so it's not a normal network that we could get access to here, but if you're out there, you would have access to it. Uh, there's the DMR of Anarchy, which is in North Car or, uh, Northern California. They've taken the uh, servers from the DMR mark uh, and reprogram them and, and built their own network out there. Uh, there's also the PAPA system out in Southern California, which is uh, currently using the uh, Brandmeister system. So, uh, so there's a lot of forms. Of course, your DMR radio will work on all of these. As long as you have the proper talk groups set up, you can uh, work within that system. Okay, just a quick comparison here, DMR Mark and uh, Brandmeister, because as you get into this, look on the internet, uh, this is the names you're gonna see. So DMR Mark was first introduced in 2009, Brandmeister much newer, 2015. Uh, DMR Mark uses the Seabridge, that's what they call their master server. So if you're looking at a page and see Seabridge, then you know you're talking about DMR Mark. What's also confusing is DR, DMR mark on the internet is sometimes just abbreviated DMR, which is confusing because it's not the same as DMR radio. So, th so that adds to confusion. So there's uh, things like Seabridge and other terms and things after a while, you sort of pick up and, and know which uh, camp they're connected with. So you know whether the stuff on their webpage is gonna be pertinent to what you're looking for or not. Uh, so DMR mark uh, in that system, the network layer is uh, really you know what what makes it DMR mark versus Brandmeister, and the repeaters control the talk groups. They control which talk groups are available, and there's no changing that, and you just are a user of that service. Whereas over in Brandmeister, uh, all talk groups are available. Now, when I say all talk groups are available, there's a little asterisk there because the repeater owners do have sometimes some constraints on what talk groups you can use on a particular time slot, either one or two for that repeater. And they might even ban certain talk groups because of the uh, volume during the day. And if, if they allowed that talk group on, uh, nobody else might be able to get in there. So, so there are some caveats there, but otherwise in general, Brandmeister, all talk groups available on all the nodes. Uh, DMR Mark has uh, a little bit more hierarchy where they have uh, worldwide talk groups and national talk groups and regional talk groups, and you really can't break out of there. So you can't reach into another region and uh, connect up to conversations and talk groups in that area. 
Whereas again, a Brandmeister passes all that information through. Also, Brandmeister is a little more open in that it allows hotspots. The original DMR did not, but DMR plus does connect hotspots into the DMR mark system now. So, but just to flavor the two, not that anyone is uh, better or worse than the other, uh, just different features. Uh, if you travel different areas in the country, uh, different areas might be more leaning towards one or the other in the Rochester area, Brandmeister is what's on the local repeaters. Okay, so I got out my special software and drew up this diagram. So this is based on that pyramid where we have our master servers up at the top here. They're using connected through an ISP and they talk together and, and send traffic back and forth. There are three master servers in the US and they are numbered 3101 and 3102, uh, Rich, 3103. All right, Rich, you got a, a question from Paul Conway. Paul, sure. open your mic, please. KD2DO, you want to open your mic and ask your question about uh, channels? Yeah, um, just a basic question before um, um, we get into the details here. Uh, what is the overall purpose of DMR? Is it um, just to get more channels that, or what? Well, uh I would say one, it uses narrow band instead of wide band. So it's only half the size and you can get more uh, connections in. And you know, part of the problem in the world is the cell phone industry is gobbling up all the bandwidth. And every day we hear about how the FCC is reallocating more bandwidth. So there's only so much bandwidth. And even though we keep going higher and higher, there's properties such as propagation distances that limit that that upper end. So I think just going forward, a digital radio offers the ability to put more channels in a, a fixed bandwidth than using the wider analog channels. Okay. Um, it seems like the VHF, UHF uh, spectrum really isn't being used that much, at least around here. Uh, do we have a problem? Nope. I think it's just uh, usage. You know, digital is growing. It's just another form, you know, is uh, from analog to digital. So it's just another uh, area of ham radio. You know, you have uh, your regular HF, you have your VHF and UHF, uh, you have your satellite communications, your moon bounce. And so it's just one more tool in the ham radio for, uh, you know, doing something different. And in this case, you know, sometimes uh, if band conditions don't allow for it, you can still communicate with someone in certain parts of the world because uh, it uses the internet as the uh, underlying uh, backbone. Okay. And this is Brian, just another benefit. Uh, the guy who got me into DMR, uh, Jeff W. Uh, to JTF, um, he loves it when he goes on like cruises or on vacations because he's able to take his hotspot and his DMR radio and keep in touch with people here in Monroe County via his internet link on the cruise ship or wherever he is. So it's great to be able to stay in local contact with people as well or talk to people in Ireland or wherever you want to talk to. All right, very good, so good question. Internet talk group, okay. Uh, back to your presentation. All right. Thanks for the question. Okay. So our connections here, we have our master servers, uh, the country. Uh, so each country typically has one. Uh, the U.S. has three just because the size and the volume. Uh, then there's ISP connection down to the repeaters and then using RF down to the radio. So radio A could go through, talk to a repeater, go up to the master server, down through a repeater, talk to radio B. Or uh, radio B might go up through the master server over into another master server and down into radio C. Uh, this one's with a hotspot. Now, additionally, these radios also are capable of working in a local mode where uh, radio C could talk to a repeater. And depending on the talk group, there's some of the talk groups are special in that 
sense that they don't actually get sent up to the master server and, and sent up through the network. And so you could uh, communicate just on your local repeater and it would be a local connection. And then there's simplex. So uh, digital radio, just like analog can talk, RF simplex. There are some pre-allocated frequencies. We'll cover these uh, later in the presentation on and how to, how to get connected through simplex. So that's how the network layers uh, work for DMR. Okay, talk groups, Brandmeister talk groups. What are they? Well, ultimately they are just a number and it's a way to connect up with someone else. Just like a phone number in a published book or a talk group or a chat room that has some common name, uh, you can communicate with someone because you and that other person have agreed upon a particular talk group number. Uh, so there are official talk group numbers that are uh, published by Brandmeister and registered with them. And uh, some examples, there are some uh, c talk groups allocated at the particular country level. They are allocated for particular states or regions within the states. There are some talk groups that are based on topic and are, are worldwide. And then there are some uh, that are organized or along different language. So if you want to uh, go to a talk group and just talk French or Spanish or English or Russian, you could do that. Now in the US, uh, a lot of the uh, regional talk groups have all been assigned because each state will find out a little bit only gets 10 regional codes. And what's happened is a lot of people rushed out and uh, reserved these uh, talk groups, used them all up, and then like anything, they used them for a short time and then they don't get that much traffic anymore. So not only can you use the registered talk groups, but you can use other uh, names, or I sorry, numbers, such as your radio IDs or your repeater IDs, because they're all part of the same uh, identifier space that we'll talk about in another slide. Uh, so talk groups, there's a lot of them, thousands and thousands, and uh, we'll talk about uh, where to go and find that information and, and what they are. Okay, so there's a little structure to the talk groups in that the uh, cell world had some allocations of uh, numbers, prefix numbers, and so Brandmeister and uh, DMR mark adopted those. So as we get into these, you'll see that if the initial number is prefixed by certain numbers here, it indicates a particular region like three is North America. Then there are three digit country codes. So we can see France is 208 and that's part of the European group. And uh, US is uh, th in the group uh, started with a three. In fact, uh, we own, uh, 10 different slots for our country codes. So most country codes will just get one US because of our volume, we have a nine. So, uh, and then we have Japan, just some examples. So we're gonna go off, take a quick peek at this URL, which is the official Brandmeister uh, link for talk groups. And this is what you get. So you can go to a lot of places on the internet to find out talk groups. Hopefully you'll be looking at a Brandmeister talk group list and not a, a DMR mark, because if you use theirs, uh, you won't get the same responses that you expect. Now, sometimes these talk groups change in allocation, so it's important to get a most recent one. So this is one place to go to know that you're getting a, uh, a, an accurate one. So in the beginning, there's these special ones, one digit, they look at, uh, and those are used for local circumstances. In two uh, digit ones, a little more specialized. Uh, these are, I guess you could almost say continent wise. They aren't really talk groups. Well, I guess they are talk groups, uh, but they're very large in size. Here are the country codes. So Netherlands is 204, 206, France 208. We can roll down here. to US, so here's 310, 
through 319. And uh, so you'll see these have been named, these are the famous tech groups that are used in the US. Uh, the first three are actually cross connected into the DMR mark system uh, for sharing information there. Then if we go down, you end up starting to add digits so that, for example, 204 is Netherlands, and then they have 204 1, 204 2 for different regions in that area, probably similar to our states. So if we go down here, to the 3100, here's US, is uh, Brandmeister US National Bridge, 3100, and then we get our states, 3101, 3102 is Alaska. Here's California, 3106. Uh, we're missing 3107 because California is actually has two state codes associated with that state because Rich. of their size. Yes. Rich, we've got a question from uh, Dave, KD2RAF. Sure. What's your question, Dave? Yeah, the question is, uh, what, what is the tech group you just and a few minutes ago? Yeah, the TAC is um, mostly just to make contact, short conversations, uh, just to find people and then move, up to, move off to another location. Uh, there are some talk groups on there, but uh, pretty much it's just a way to get a big coverage. Uh, again, with Brandmeister, talk groups are uh, sent throughout the system. So you can, you know, someone in Australia can still connect on our Monroe County talk group. You just have to agree that that's the number you want to meet at, and then you both set your radios, and then you're communicating, and you'll be able to communicate. But if you want to find someone at a national level, you might want to go to a TAC group like 310 to see who is out there, start a conversation, and then if it starts getting too long, you might want to move off to a, uh, another talk group. Thank you, Dave. All right. Thank you for that. So, uh, so this is a pretty big file, and uh, we'll look at some other structure on the next slide. Uh, what I'm going to do is pop out and bring up a this is a PDF I put together. So I wrote a computer program to take that feed from Brandmeister and trim it down so that it takes out all the countries except for the US. So it keeps the first uh, two digits here, uh, but then we jump right in here, the US tech codes. Then we have the national. Now my ordering here, I really like the way it worked out. So I don't order these numerically, but I, I order them a computer programmer would know string wise, so that the 3101 would sort right before the 3101 one O. But what this does is this shows you here's Alabama and then here are all the talk groups, the regional ones in Alabama, which would be 3101 and then 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 6. And then Alaska. We could see Alaska has only two regional groups. So it keeps the regionals together. We can go down to New York. Rich, uh, yes. the question is, can that, is that available for download your list? Yes, I will give this to Scott and have him post these on, the, on our uh, rah, rah net. So 3136 is New York. And then we could see the, the 10 regional groups that are allowed under there in Monroe County is 31369 down at the bottom. So this goes through all the different states. Uh, and at some point, the, uh, the states finish up. And then there's a lot left over. So uh, that's sort of a catch-all. So there's all kinds of talk groups here of interest that you can catch up. Down here, we have some regional. So there's southwest, southeast US, southwest, southern plains, mountain. Uh, topics like weather watching, Liberty Talk Group, 
Missouri Lakes. So there's a lot of interesting talk groups there. And then I also bring in the, uh, the, the nine digits, which are sort of a worldwide group. And so you get a lot of other ones there. Here's the parrot, which we'll talk about, which is their echo. Here's Ecom US. Uh, here's worldwide events, coronavirus. So there's even a talk group just for coronavirus. Here's an AMSAT. Now, at the end here, uh, we've been dealing with only five digit talk groups. That goes up through the regionals. And that's because group seven or six is for repeaters. But what's happened is the uh, regions are all used up because each state only gets 10 codes per state. So, uh, and also Brandmeister is, is clamping down on just registering anybody as they come along anymore because the resources is, is running dry. So they recommend initially uh, you can use your repeater ID as a talk group as a way to drum up traffic and if there's enough traffic over enough long enough time, like three or six months, then they'll, they'll make it more official. So I grouped these down here. Um, we could see even here is, uh, is Northwest Finger Lakes DMR. And the reason they're grouped down separately is they don't, repeaters don't fall into the geographic allocation that the talk groups above do. So if you look at the four digit prefix on Western New York Finger Lakes, it's 3107, which is actually the country or the state code for California, even though that talk group is not in California. So uh, it would, would have been bad to put them under the regional area. So I just group all the repeater talk groups down here. Now, let's say you have a talk group, a name, and you don't have a number, and you want to look up that number, but you need a reference. So the second portion of this report, I sorted it by name. And it's case insensitive, so there, it handles all the uppercase, lowercase. So we'll make this available. This is a handy thing when you have a name and you're trying to look up the number, because ultimately the radio needs a number to be coded in. Now you can assign any kind of name. You can use the official name that Brandmeister assigns it, or you can put whatever name you want in your radio, but it's the number that determines whether you're gonna talk to anybody. All right, so we'll leave that. So we'll make sure to get that available for everybody. All right, so we covered that structure. So hopefully you have a better sense of uh, where to find talk groups and uh, how they're structured. Now here's another way to look at the structure. Uh, this sort of summarizes, as I mentioned before, uh, by digit. So one digit are very special talk groups because there's only nine out there. Uh, then there's the special talk groups, which is 10 through 99. Country codes are three digits, four digits are state talk groups, then your regents are five, and then your repeaters are six digits, and then your radio IDs that you receive for your unique radio are seven digits. But all of these can become talk groups because they're all viewed in the radio as a uh, identifier. And inside the code plug, they're stored as a three byte number. So it's a large space uh, given the three bytes and you could see how they're allocated. Uh, so talk groups, repeater, and uh, also hotspot IDs fall in that uh, digit number six and then radio IDs. So there's three different IDs, but they're all the same in the sense that you could use those all as a talk group. It's just that the official talk groups are a little more common because they're a little more well known. But if you wanted to set a talk group and use your radio ID and tell your buddy across the country to use that, you could use that talk group to communicate. Now remember, there's nothing private about that because anybody can listen in on your, on your conversations. It's just a way for you to coordinate and not uh, hit a talk group number that someone else is gonna be using at the same time. All right. So I uh, went out to the site that we'll, we'll visit later that shows the, uh, all the IDs. And so this is broken down by country. So there's a total of 99 countries that have radio ID, DMR IDs. And this includes 
uh, not only a Brandmeister, but a DMR mark and any of the other networks that use uh, DMR radios. So there's 99 countries represented, 97,000 IDs have been assigned on US, uh, over 72,000. So you could see why we get 10 country codes because the volume. And then Canada, China, Australia, Brazil, Chile, and Japan. Okay, so breakdown by state. Uh, so this is how states, California above everybody else, over 7,000, then Florida, Texas, Ohio, New York, North Carolina, Colorado. Colorado is interesting uh, because I look at, at their code plugs. Uh, I, I try to analyze code plugs sometimes to understand strategies and, and what people use them. They seem to be the most advanced state out there with the DMR technology. You know, California is a close second. No, but those two states are, are really leaders, I think, in uh, DMR technology in the US. Okay, now let's go visit some of those Brandmeister websites and see what's up. So we're going to the main dashboard, uh, which is brandmeister.network. <clears throat> so this shows a worldwide map and I believe the colored spots are where people are transmitting at the moment. Uh, we're gonna look at the repeater section. So we just click here, repeaters. So up here, we could type in, I'm just gonna type in RIT for the moment. And so we'll go look at the repeater at RIT. We could just type in a call sign up there. So this will show the location of where that repeater or hotspot is. This is the repeater section, but we'll look at the hotspot section in a minute. This is the last heard, so it'll tell you uh, who was just on this RIT repeater, the talk group they were using, their call sign, what master it's connected in, and how many minutes ago it was, and it'll also give you some signal strength information. Additionally, over here, it'll tell you the location, uh, the hardware, power, two slots, uh, what master it's hooked into, the frequencies, the offset, the color code. So this is all the information you're gonna need when we get to that section on programming. And that's why we're not starting at programming because to program radio you need such an, a, a tremendous amount of information and you have no idea where to get it. So by the time we get there, we're gonna know where to get everything. This shows the two time slots and this shows some talk groups on there. And we're not going to, uh, we're going to come back at another time uh, when we talk more about repeaters and talk more about that section. Here's the antenna information. So all the information you want to know about that. So we'll go back to dashboard so we can click on hotspots. This is Brian's hotspot here. And uh, so same kind of layout as the repeaters. So the, here's uh, talk groups Brian's been connecting to, location, time slot information, repeater information. Okay, we'll go back to dashboard and uh, we can click on masters. This will show us the masters. We'll reverse sort on the countries. Here are the US servers. And it could look at the status if you're interested in the status for that main. Now, uh, there were more, I think at one time, eight master servers. Uh, 3108 was just taken offline. So right now, US is going with three. Uh, there's a alert section where I could touch on, but if you're interested in alerts uh, such as the master servers and, and repeaters alerts, uh, it'll do those. There's some data visualization, uh, talk groups, clusters, reflectors, uh, network structure. So I'll leave this up to everyone else to go visit. Uh, information, there is a wiki where to go over. So this is uh, information about the network. We can go into countries. Go down, look at United States. This is 
good information for the US. So again, here's the three main servers. This time shows you the location of those. Call sign managed by IP addresses. So if you were a hotspot operator and you needed to, or a repeater and needed to hook into a master server, you'd need this page for information. Uh, this talks about updates for the areas, uh, information talk groups, things like that, master servers coming and going away, creation of talk groups. Uh, so this is just handy, talks about talk groups in there. So we can't go through all this, but it'll, more information, here's information about repeaters. If you have specific repeaters you'd like to bring online, specific hotspot information, this is the place to go. Okay, so besides this, now there's also hose line, which was a mechanism where you could actually go out to the internet and listen in on a particular talk group, but it hasn't been active lately. And I fear that I did see one note indicating that the programmer that was supporting that is no longer supporting that. So that might be a, a feature not available anymore. So, so we're not gonna touch on that. Uh, but it is available on the on the dash that main dashboard. Uh, so there's also a news website, which is very important. Uh, this keeps you up to date. Here's the master server removal there. So this is a good page to come to periodically for get information on network changes, upcoming changes, recommendations. Here's a, a, a note that we're gonna to touch on a little later, which is I talked about how if you wanted to talk to a local a repeater and just have a local talk group that didn't go into the master servers and spread out throughout the system, here's the information on the two techniques you could use. We're gonna cover this shortly, but there's the detailed information where I got my information from. So again, the uh, Dashboard and the news and wiki are three important places to learn more information about the network portion of Brandmeister. Okay, so that finishes up the network layer. So hopefully now you have a pretty good feeling for what the network provides, Brandmeister, how it's different from DMR Mark, what are talk groups, how they're arranged countries and states and regions. Now we're gonna talk about the link layer, specifically repeaters, hotspots, touch on some phone apps. And we're also gonna talk about simplex uh, because even though it doesn't use repeaters or hotspots, this is a, a good area I found to talk about that. Okay. So repeaters, digital repeaters, here's a comparison you could see transmit receive frequencies, color codes. I mentioned CTCSS is uh, what color codes are. There's also time slots, time slots one and two. Okay, other radios actually, some radio systems provide four talk group, uh, time, not talk groups, but four time slots. But for DMR, we only have two talk group, two time slots. And then there's also talk groups will be important at the repeater level. So. Talk about static and dynamic talk groups. This is a new term. So a static talk group is a talk group that the repeater or the hotspot owner has programmed in to make it always available, which means if you go to that uh, radio at that, that repeater at that frequency, you will hear that talk group if your radio is programmed to receive that talk group. If it's not, you won't, even though the airwaves will be busy transferring information. You won't see that talk group. Unless of course your radio has a feature called promiscuous mode, which we'll talk about later, where you can hear activity that your radio is not pre-programmed to listen to. So dynamic talk group is where the repeater operator has not predetermined for you to use that particular uh, talk group. But by just keying up on your radio and pinging that repeater or hotspot for just a second, 
it tells that node to start bringing that traffic down and making it available for the next 15 minutes. Now, repeater owners and uh, hotspot owners also can control or have rules as to which time slot certain talk groups can be available on. So some of the more used talk groups at the national, which would be the TAC level, the 310, or na US national 3100, or the state level, there's a lot more traffic. So there might be restrictions that the repeater owner has imposed as to which talk group and time slot it should go on. So typically, a repeater owner will have local talk groups on one time slot and then national on another time slot. That way, the local people can get in to carry on their local conversations. And if you want to do something national, you can. And they separate it that way. Sometimes repeater owners might have no rules, which means you can use any talk group on any time slot. Doesn't matter. And some repeater owners, they don't even want you to have some of the national or our worldwide talk groups on. They forbid those. And if you get them mad, they could just key up their uh, or program their repeater so they won't accept your radio ID. So you want to be good friends with repeaters owners. Uh, so over to local talk groups I touched on. So the repeaters do not transfer any talk group starting from one up to 90 up to the master servers. So if you were to use any of those talk groups, it would be local to that repeater only only but they don't recommend using the single digit codes particularly nine which is local slash reflector because if someone connects a reflector to that talk group it won't be local anymore so brandmeister in that news article i just referred to recommends if you want a local talk group you should use 10 through 90 to be safe now let's say one of your buddies that you have a uh, Saturday morning net chat is visiting his brother in California. He's not going to be able to hear your conversation because it won't be transferred up to the master servers. So the alternative is to use a repeater, your repeater ID or your hotspot ID as your local talk group number. So that way you still are local in the sense that you won't be bumping into any traffic on the other assigned talk groups. But since the number is over 90, it will go, that traffic will go up to the master server and be available anywhere in the network. So your buddy in California will be able to key in, and use the dynamic talk group on his local repeater in Southern California and be able to join in your conversation on Saturday morning. So two techniques for local talk groups. One is a little more local than the other. All right, so we're going to go over to, oh, can I find my mouse? Back to the repeater dashboard. We'll go back to RIT. So down here, we could see that time slot one is open. Time slot two actually has this ID. We could see it's a six, six digit ID, which means it's a repeater talk group. And there's no Monroe County. Uh, one would think maybe they would have Monroe County, but that's okay. Uh, but if someone was to be talking to the RAP repeater and had the Monroe County talk group and they key up, we would see it come in with a different icon. And we're gonna go try that in a little bit. But this locked icon, that means it's static, means it's fixed, it's always on, always available. Now, sometimes people have rules up top here. So let's go back to the dashboard. And we're gonna go to hotspots. We'll go back to Brian's hotspot.
So we could see here, this is Monroe County. You could see the thunderbolt there. That means it's dynamic. And that's the expire time that shows 10.59. So uh, I think it's configurable, but uh, generally it's 15 minutes when you key up a dynamic static group, a dynamic talk group. So what this is saying is on Brian's hotspot right now, if there's any Monroe County traffic, it'll automatically be sent out over that, uh, over the frequency, 446.5 megahertz on his hotspot, color code one. And that'll be available. As soon as it expires, it won't be available anymore unless he keys up on that talk group or he can key up on any other talk group he chooses. And then here's a uh, 31369. Oh, so that's actually the uh, static. So that's interesting. I've never seen that where there's a dynamic and a static at the same time. Uh, so, hey, Brian, we didn't ask ahead of time. I didn't check, but do you, you must have another talk group on your reflect on your uh, hotspot, right? Yeah, if you refresh. So if you want to watch you key up on one of those so we can see it pop up on the screen here. Yeah, if you refresh, you should see that a dynamic changed. I went to uh, upstate New York talk group, I think it is. Okay, there we go. 31361. So that we could see now that's till 1110. That's available. So that's how they work. So let's go back out to hotspots. Okay, this is another, oh, actually we wanted to be on repeaters. So this is a repeater out in Greece. And we could see time slot, Monroe County is locked. And then on time slot two, there's a couple of other talk groups. And up here in the description, we could see use country or, or color code one, and then time slot one, talk group, and that's Monroe County only. So this owner has indicated that Monroe County is of, to be used on time slot one only. And this is only be used on time slot one. Time slot two, do not use anything below 3101. So what he's saying is anything national, the TAC groups, any country codes, do not use on time slot one. In fact, on his repeater, not at all. But uh, anything else under there so that US states, 3107, they're available in all the regional and any other talk groups. So that's where you find information. So if there's no description of the repeater, then it's open. Otherwise, this, this are the uh, restrictions that the repeater operator has imposed. Okay, so now hopefully you have a sense of static and dynamic. Uh, also, a recent change in Brandmeister, they used to allow the TAC codes to be statically attached to repeaters and hotspots, and now they've made those dynamic only. All right, so there's repeaters. Hotspots. Okay, so hotspot is a uh, lower cost solution to owning a repeater, because we all know repeaters are typically thousands of dollars to get a good repeater. Uh, installed on a high location, pay rent, connection, insurance, all that, high tower, rent, expensive. So the great thing about digital radio is Brian was saying before you go on a cruise or you, you don't have a repeater in your area, you buy one of these hotspots and you can buy them for a few hundred dollars all packaged together. If you have a Raspberry Pi sitting around, you can buy a hat for say $100 that goes right on the top of your Raspberry Pi and turns it into a hotspot. That hat is the, we could see the antenna and then there's a hat on the top and underneath there's most likely a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so really you can, they can be programmed to use uh, either time slot or both time slots because you're really not uh, 
there's not a lot of hardware behind there, so there's only just one connection because it's really just you as the user, uh, unlike a repeater where you might have many people coming in, hotspots usually a personal thing. Uh, there's no real color code necessary, or you know, so most people just use color code one. Uh, you can have static and dynamic talk groups, uh, but I believe you can only have one static talk group. I personally don't own a, a hotspot right now. I'm uh, hoping to get one soon. So I'm not going to cover a lot more beyond hotspots, uh, but I know Steve uh, KA1CNF is going to be, he's our one of our hotspot experts in the group, and he's going to, uh, when he gets talking about a fusion, we'll talk more about hotspots. Okay, phone apps. Uh, so there are some phone apps out there. These are three you can search, go to your uh, either Apple store or uh, Android store, search on Brandmeister, and these are three out there. I have the uh, repeater ones. So you could tell it to find your, use your GPS coordinates and you can put in and say, show me all the repeater hotspots within one mile, two miles, 10 miles, 20 miles. And it'll, and it'll show that information. If you have a hotspot, you can control that hotspot through one of these apps. Uh, there's also uh, computer apps to, to control your hotspots. And again, I don't own one, so I, I'm not real expert in that area, but uh, others that follow will Rich, have more information. Excuse yes, Tim. me, <coughs> Roger uh, Burkhardt, a uh, question on hotspots. Okay. Roger, open your mic. Yeah, just a question. Uh, uh, you might not be able to answer this, but uh, uh, one spot uh, has come out with a model called One Spot Three, which has the ability to have one radio, one digital radio, either DMR, Fusion, or D Star, and you can say you have a D Star radio, and and it will go out and communicate with DMR or, or Fusion and, and, uh, or any mix or match of this. Since there's no uh, DMR code plug in the, in the D-Star radio, I'm assuming you must also have to have a, a PC connected to your, to your one spot to uh, have all the, this DMR information somehow inside the one spot as opposed to in the radio. I don't know if you can answer that or not. I can't, but Steve or Mike, you might be able to answer that. This is Brian. Uh, so Brian. my uh, Raspberry Pi with an MMDVM hat actually does have the ability to do some of that cross bridging between the various modes. And it, as far as I can tell, I haven't actually set it up yet, but from what I've looked into on it, it looks like it's just a matter of, um, uh, Steve, one sec, we'll uh, open you up and let you contribute here. Um, it looks like it does the transcoding within the system. So as long as it's a, you know, sizable pie, it should be okay. But Steve, uh, go ahead and uh, add anything to what I just said. Okay, for uh, uh, a different uh, AMBI uh, uh, vocoder is used for uh, D-Star. So Roger, if you mean the open spot, not the one spot, the open spot three has an AMBI 3000 um, hardware built into it. Uh, and that's what does the transcoding uh, between the uh, digital modes and, and, uh, and D-Star. On the Pi-Star, um, you can do transcoding between DMR, Fusion, and P25, but you cannot do transcoding to and from D-Star because it doesn't have the uh, AMB3000 hardware in it. Um, does that answer your question there, uh, Roger? I think so, but somehow you still have to put that information in, inside the uh, open spot. Is that correct? With a, with um, a PC or something? Yeah, you, you, there's a, a quick programming for the open spot. Um, it's basically got a computer built into it. You don't need an, a separate computer. So everything is done within the open spot three. Um, the open spot one, the open spot two does not have the, uh, the hardware transcoder in it. Um, it's only the open spot three. So just having an open spot three um, program in for whatever uh, transcoding you want to do and then with your fusion radio or whatever you can go to uh, um, DMR, um, D-Star or, or P25. The uh, fusion radio um, broadcasts the uh, 
your call sign, you put that into the radio, and not all, all times will your call, call sign be going over to, uh, to DMR and uh, P25. Okay, thank you. I'm about ready to pull the trigger on uh, on that open spot three. Okay. <laughs> Just if, if you have any questions, I have I have one, Roger. If you want to uh, um, separately email me or or whatever, I can uh, discuss it further with you. Thanks, Dave. All right, good question. Uh, and and I should have made a slide actually to talk about all this cross connection between all the the three different uh, digital radios because a lot of the repeaters these days are switching over to handle all three and doing the conversion between those. And I believe RIT is, is one of those. Uh, so more and more is this, and that's, I think sometimes what leads to confusion is that you read one thing on the network that says you can't do that. And then, but you have a radio that, that can. And the reason is because every year that goes by, things are changing. The radio manufacturers are changing features, adding features that people are calling for. So in the beginning, your repeater was either you were D-Star or a DMR or a Fusion, that was it. And now more and more of the repeaters handle all three. Uh, sometimes you have to be careful, although because it does take time for the repeater to switch to the different uh, system, but it does allow you to uh, use repeaters for all three different radios and interconnect them. So I'll have to add a slide if I do this presentation again. Okay, so phone apps. Uh, just going to, you know, mostly as a reference here, but go out and check your phone uh, for apps for Brandmeister. Okay, digital simplex. Uh, so there are some pre-assigned frequencies by the FCC, or at least the ARRL. I'm not sure which uh, designates these, uh, but these are set up for VHF, UHF, uh, so there's three main ways you can use uh, you can use digital simplex. One is if you have the radio capable of promiscuous mode. And what that does is it says, you know, right now when you program your radio, when we do shortly, you're going to have to put in a uh, color code and select a time slot and pick that talk group that you want to use to talk through the repeater. And if you don't have all those three set, you may not be able to communicate with someone. But with promiscuous mode on your radio, it kind of throws all those things away and allows you to listen in on either one or both time slots, uh, whatever country code is set, and whatever talk group. So that's kind of the easiest way to do uh, simplex. Now, second way, there was a standard that was originally set in DMR mark, which was to use color code one, time slot one, talk group 99. That was a lot of people give the name direct. And if uh, both people are using that, then you can key up your radios and you'll hear each other. In addition, there's a specialized talk group uh, with that very large number. It's called All Call, though. We'll see when we get to CPS programming, it's just called All Call. And you'll just blast through. So no matter what the radio is set to, if you transmit on All Call, whoever is on that simplex frequency, they're going to hear you. And if you're wondering how in the world they ever came up with a number like that, you'll recall earlier I mentioned that the talk groups and the repeater IDs and radio IDs are stored in the code plug as a three byte number. And so if you were to put in your calculator FF, uh, FF, FF, and uh, look at the decimal interpretation of that, that's the number you get. So that is the last identifier in that three byte namespace that the radio code plug uses to represent all call. Uh, so that I think is the surest way to get through on the other side is to uh, specify an all call in your radio. All right, so we're gonna leave the link layer and move into our last layer, which is radio layer. And again, I mentioned DMR radio, you have hardware, you have your firmware and your code plug, which is your configuration. So here's a quick diagram that shows what we're gonna be doing. We have, I have my radio hooked up with a USB cable into my CPS program, which is provided by the manufacturer and is uh, customized for my particular radio. And there's also a particular version that matches my firmware. So if I have firmware 
version 2.33, I should be using uh, CPS program version 2.33. Uh, and if they get out of whack, they'll uh, probably tell you that they, uh, the uh, versions don't match and you should use the appropriate one. Now we'll look at the code plug, which is stored as a, about a two meg file, uh, is an RDT file. And CPS can read your radio and download that code plug onto your computer. It's a good thing to make a backup. So if you spend a lot of time configuring your radio, you wanna save that code plug uh, in case something happens. You can read it into CPS from the disk and then write it back into your radio. You also have the ability to import and export CSV files. These are files that have comma separated values. That's what CSV stands for. And we'll look at some samples of that. Uh, so that's a good way. Uh, sometimes rather than use the CPS program to program up your changes, you can just use a CSV file, which you can bring into your favorite uh, spreadsheet like Excel and edit that directly or if you know someone with a computer program or a computer programmer who can code up you can write your own programs to manipulate files and build those files for you import them into cps and then load them into your radio and cps is also used to read your firmware that you've downloaded from the manufacturer's website and load into your radio so uh, so it's taken a long time to get to this bottom layer. This is the layer that usually you get introduced to first if you don't have a, a good presentation like this. And that's why things I think get overwhelming is because you're trying to learn everything. We just spent the last hour just talking about the network layer, just talking about the link layer. And now we're finally to the radio layer. Okay, so here's just a quick rundown of some manufacturers and a few radios available. I was going to populate more of this, but I had so much material to assemble that I was not able to. So I apologize if your favorite radio is not on that list, but uh, those are the uh, big manufacturers and a small sample of the radios. Okay, programming tools. So there's CPS, uh, which I would think uh, calls, it stands for code plug software. Uh, but I've never seen anything that says what CPS is for. Uh, so N0GSG is uh, somebody who wrote this contract or contact program manager, uh, which is an easier way to uh, manage your uh, contacts. I have not used it, but it, but it seems pretty popular on the internet. And uh, so I want to make people aware of that. A couple of other programmers have made these other programs, Edit CP and CPS Programmer. And there's links at the end of this presentation that we'll be posting on the website that you'll have so you can go investigate further. Okay, so we're gonna do a demo of CPS program. I'm gonna read a code plug, export some CSV files, and then we're gonna talk about some things. Uh, and, uh, and we're gonna talk about these terms. So I'll put this up here, and then we're gonna go jump in and, and look at these. Uh, but we're gonna talk about channel, which of course is just uh, the frequency settings, like on an analog, but it also has a talk group, time slot, the uh, country, or the color code. And, uh, and we'll see in CPS how to do that. We'll go look at the CSV file. And uh, in a little bit, we're gonna run a video and show this on the actual radio. What a zone is, is a way to group a bunch of channels for organizational purposes. What you'll find is some of these code plugs have five, six, seven hundred, even a thousand channels. So that would be difficult to have a, a rotator knob trying to spin through to find those. So zones are a way to group a bunch of channels together. If anyone has some of the more advanced scanners these days, you're probably aware of what zones are and uh, you have a feature on your scanner like that. So Typically, I'll put zones uh, It's a particular area of interest, such as the tour de cure. I would take some of those frequencies that the uh, operators are using for tour de cure and put it in a zone for that. Uh, if I'm going to my Florida house, I would put a zone together with all the repeaters in that area. If I'm going to Richmond, Virginia for a NASCAR race, I would put all the repeaters in for that area and call it Richmond zone. 
uh, might have might want an ecom zone for emergency communications all the uh, Aries uh, repeaters in the area uh, your favorite nets zone uh, so it's sort of you know you can build all kinds of zones uh, scan lists are uh, going to be a list you put together for when you're in a, on a particular channel and you press your scan on your scan button on your phone, it's going to start scanning channels. And that scan list is not, uh, you would think that when they built the radio, if you put a bunch of channels in a zone and you press scan, it's just going to scan all those channels in that zone, but they made it a little more flexible in that you have to build a list of channels to scan and then you associate that one scan list with the channel. Receive groups, I'm not sure most people use these these days because the radios have more advanced, but earlier in the day, early days, if you wanted to listen on a particular talk group, like you wanted to transmit and receive back on that talk group, you'd have to put that talk group in your receive group. And let's say you might want to be aware of other traffic going on, sort of like a scanning going on while you're sitting on one channel and, and receiving information on those talk groups, you could add those extra talk groups in. But the radios have scanning and they have promiscuous modes, so uh, that that is a lot of work to uh, put all those receive groups together. So there's there's easier features. Uh, we'll look at FM stations. Your radios probably are capable of, of receiving FM broadcast stations. Uh, we're going to uh, do some option settings, and uh, again, talk groups are important this layer. And then there's digital context, which are all the people that have allocated a radio ID so that when someone you're listening to on a talk group starts talking, their call sign and name and location are going to pop up on your radio screen. Okay, so we're going to jump into CPS. So here's what CPS looks like when you start it up. This is empty. This is sort of the default settings. I've already turned on my uh, radio a few minutes ago. I'm going to check Oh, so we're gonna run through a few things. So in the file here, these are the code plugs, so we can either open. Here's three different code plugs. We'll pull one up in a little bit. Well, we could pull this up now. This is demo. So this is gonna read the code plug off of disk and load it in. So they can see all those channels. Uh, let's see, model just shows the a model of the radio and the band frequencies available. And let's see, so SETCOM is the communications port that we're gonna use. There's also an icon, so we could look here. We could see I'm on COM6. Let's see, so here's where we would read from the radio, write from the radio. There's also icons up above here. That This is how to read from a radio and there's the right icon. Under tools, we could record, import, export. Uh, and here's export data conversion file. This is an, another kind of file besides a code plug, which is used by that contact manager to uh, pass information back and forth. So we're going to take while we're here and export some of these files. So these are, we just touched on their zones. There's radio ID list, scan list, talk groups, address book. We could download individual files, or if I just want to export everything, I could click on here, export all up here. I'm going to create a new folder called CSV files. Oh, I already have that. What do you know? Okay, I'm going to put in here a name. Going to just rewrite. It's called files.list. So this is a file that's going to contain the list of all the files. And now I just say yes. It's going to export everything. Export complete. I will go into our explorer here. Oh, I didn't put the I didn't put the CSV files where I thought I did. So we're going to go do that again. 
Okay. So that's why when I create the file, it was already there or folder. Okay, CSV files. We're gonna do that again. There's my file that'll contain my list of files. Export all, export complete. Okay, so now when we go back over here, I have CSV files. <clears throat> and so this is just a list of files. So this is just a list. There's channels, radio ID list, zone, scan list. Those are all. So if I just click, double click on channels, here's a list a spreadsheet of all the channels. So there's Bristol, receive frequency transmit, channel type, transmitter, power, bandwidth, CTCS, local context. So some of these columns are for mainly for digital, some are just for analog channels because this radio does both, but that's a sample of the channel. So if I want to go in and edit channels this way or add new channels, I could do that. And I could re-import this file back into CPS and I wouldn't have to use their interface. Or again, if I had a computer program, it, it could manipulate it that way. So we'll go back here and look at, let's see. So there's some help. So that's all the features. And we just talked about channels. Now we're gonna look at zones. So these are the zones. I have a Rochester zone, which just has a bunch of radios. My grease zone is, uh, is for digital. And it has all my talk groups for the digital uh, grease repeater. Here's a different allocation of analog. Here I just have a zone with my simplex channels. We'll double click. So here's all the channels that have been included in that particular zone. Here's all the channels I have available. So with these two arrows, we can switch and move things back and forth. We can pull them out of my zone list, add them into my zone list. I can also, uh, my radio is a dual band, so I have A channel and B channel. I can select which one of these channels will start out as the default channels in each of those bands when I move to that zone. Here's my scan list. So I tend to make my scan list the same as my zones. So what this means is this simplex scan list has all of the channels that I have in my simplex zone. And all of these channels have added the scan list uh, simplex to it. So if I'm in my radio in simplex zone and one of those channels, I press the scan key, it'll scan only those channels. So here's a list, RIT. So these has a whole bunch of uh, different groups. So there's Monroe County, Colorado HD, and then TAC 310, 311, 312. Those are all programmed up for the RIT repeater. So we could see here Tour de Cure, Simplex, local, here's Cal is Florida location. So here's FM stations. Uh, and originally I just put like popular FM stations I was going to, but then I realized if I go out of town, the allocation might be different. So I just put all the FM allocations in here. Let's see, there's, we can get basic information. So this will read out the radio and tell me what version and what the frequency bands are set to. Here's optional settings. So this is where you can set power on so that it could display this message when you power up. If you wanna set a password on, you can select the zone and channel you wanna start on on power up. For display, you can control how long to keep the light on, brightness levels. The menu exit time, things like that. If you wanna do GPS, ranging, you can do that. This is helpful in the digital world. If you 
going to communicate with somebody, it'll uh, locate their ID and, and they'll tell you how far away they are. Rich, BFO scan? Yes. Yes, you've got a, a Ron uh, Jakubowski has got a, a raised hand. He wants a question. Okay, Ron, what's your question? Yeah, this is Ron K2RJ. I'm just curious, this CPS software you're using here, is this is this specific to your radio or yes. is this a general? Okay. It, not only my radio, but the version of firmware I have in my radio. So I have to keep track when I upgrade firmware, I have to get an, uh, the appropriate CPS program from the manufacturer to match that firmware. Okay, I just yes. want to be sure. Yes, yep, yep. So other manufacturers, it may look similar to this or it might look completely different. Uh, just depends on the manufacturer, uh, how they, uh, what, code base they started with. If they started with this uh, vanilla flavor, everyone in the beginning, then they're going to look the same. Otherwise, they're going to be very different. You know, I found a, a uh, uh, I've, I've got a T -T -T -Y -T DMR, and, there, and I found a, a couple other CPS programs that, that work with it that give you a little bit more flexibility than the, uh, than the manufacturer's one. But uh, I did, this, this one here looked very good. I just, just wondered where it was from. Yes, yep, manufacturer. <laughs> okay, so uh, there's a lot of other functions. We can't, I wish we could go through all of them. Uh, so in the digital world here, this is where I would set my radio ID that I would allocate. We'll go show you how to do that a little bit. Uh, this allows you to have multiple IDs, but typically you're only going to have one ID. Everyone should really just have one ID and then the radio should have one ID. Uh, here's our talk group list. That's the end of the list. You could see also I have an all call specifically in here if I want to make a call. Uh, and then, so this is that list. So. This CSV file was created by the same program I wrote that created that PDF that we saw earlier that stripped out. It, it went to the Brandmeister website and pulled down all the talk groups and then it trimmed down and kept only the US. And uh, so not only did I generate that PDF for my program, but I generate the CSV file. So I'll uh, have Scott upload this. So if you're searching for uh, talk groups, uh, you can use this file. Now you can, you don't necessarily have to have all talk groups in your radio, just the ones your radio is programmed on. So if you, if you only are gonna use say a dozen talk groups, you could just hand code them in. Uh, but if you're fanatic like me, you want all of them, then uh, we could upload this file and this will have the 425 or so uh, talk groups that are out there that are pertinent for the US. A series of other things like encryption codes. Again, this is one of those features that was part of the uh, commercial version of the standard and shouldn't be used on our radios. Uh, here's contact list. We're not going to uh, go into that. Uh, so these are the main uh, features of CPS. Uh, so we're going to jump back to the presentation. So this was just the first pass. We're going to come back here when we actually do some programming. But we still have a little... Uh, more to cover. Okay, not sure why we ended up on this slide. Okay, so those are terms we covered. Uh, so now we're going to take a quick video of uh, my radio and look at some of these other features that aren't actually part of the program. There's the uh, VFO on the radio, dual band, promiscuous mode. Uh, you can set, one of the options you can set is power on and off or off. So if you don't use your radio for, you know, 30 minutes, it turns off by itself. Uh, this particular radio has GPS positioning. There is a, this radio, the 868 supports digital APRS. 878, I believe, uh, handles analog uh, APRS. Roaming is a feature, not on my radio, but on the uh, Anytone 878, which is nice. If you are moving around in a city and you and your radio finds that another repeater, digital or analog repeater, is uh, stronger, it will switch to that other repeater. 
Now it assumes that you have your talk groups for the digital set up appropriately so that if you're talking on a talk group and you transition to the other repeater, you'll be programmed up. But if you are, then it'll automatically switch over to that other repeater. And some radios now have Bluetooth capability like the 878, <coughs> uh, but the 868 does not. Okay, so let's jump out and do this video. Now this video doesn't have any audio because I can't, couldn't get my radio to, or my computer to play audio over. So I'm gonna talk over this video. Hopefully things are gonna go well. Uh, Rich, before you do that, uh, yes. Scott has got a question about uh, prohibited talk groups. Scott? Hey, this is uh, Scott Tice, W2LW. Uh, nice earlier time. on when we had DMR presentations, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there was some discussion about certain groups, I think like TAC 309 was one of them, that some of the repeaters didn't want you to use. Is there a published list someplace, and can you send that to me, and I will be happy to put it up that the rec uh, has that information so we don't irritate uh, repeater operators. Yeah, there is not a general list. Just the, we when we went to the Brandmeister website and looked at that repeater, there were instructions up there from that repeater owner to for that repeater. So that, that's the only place unless, now I didn't show you, but on that same repeater uh, page on Brandmeister, if the repeater operator has their own web page, there's a link to go to there so that he might have additional information there. But there is no standard available that would be published that we could present that would be uh, rules for all repeater owners because there are none. It's based okay. upon the repeater. So then the rule of thumb is look before you talk. <laughs> yes, I would say so because you don't want to make the repeater owners mad because they won't make their repeaters available if you take them off. Okay, so this is going to be interesting because this is an eight minute video. I'm going to do a talk over and hopefully I won't get lost along the way. I recorded it last night and we'll see how it goes. So here's the radio, any tone 868. There's the on off switch. I'm turning it on. That's also the volume knob. There's the uh, information from the uh, screenshot we just looked at and the options in CPS. It just turned on, I'm gonna turn the volume down so we don't get interrupted. Uh, so that'll show the channel and the zone. So we're in the Rochester zone. On the side, push to talk is on top and there's two buttons, uh, which are P1 and PF1 and PF2 on the sides. Uh, so if you press short, uh, PF1 short press, it'll tell you the uh, voltage. And if you do a long press, it's turning on that promiscuous mode, which is right there. I've turned digital monitor off. Like, let's just back up. So there's digital. I'm on double slot, which means that it's going to pick up both time slots. If I'm on a single slot, then it's only going to pick up the time slot that my radio is programmed to at that particular time. I just keep it on double slot which means I'll hear anything on that repeater. Uh, if, if you only were interested in the time slot you were about to talk on and was just making sure nobody was there so you didn't step on them, you'd, you'd just have it set to that single slot. Uh, but that's a long press on the PF1 key on the side. And then the PF2, uh, short press is your squelch, turns your squelch off so you can adjust your volume on your radio, but that's for analog channels only, doesn't apply to digital. Now on the front, we have the P1 button. If we single press that, it'll change to our dual band. So we go from one band to the other. So there's the Rochester zone and we were switching back. Now, if you press a long press, it'll switch to FM mode. So now we are actually listening on FM broadcast 99.3. Now I'm turning the channels to change to a different FM channel. The uh, channel button is the, is the first button up here and then the volume and the on off is the right hand side. And then you just long press to turn that back off. 
P2 button, short press is to turn your VFO on, and then long press will go into scan mode for the radio. So now we're scanning. And if you press any key, it'll jump out of scan mode. So now we're back out of VF mode because I short pressed and I'm going through different zones. So now I'm on the Rochester zone and I'm just scanning through here. These are the different channels. This particular channel, this particular radio, you can, uh, I don't know what the limit is. It's probably in the hundreds for a number of channels in a particular zone. Although that would be hard to have that many channels and you'd be you know, twisting your knob until it fell off the radio. So I would say like a dozen channels is, is a reasonable amount. Uh, and even that might even be a little high because uh, it just might take you too long to scan through to find the channel you're looking for. Oh, so let's pause just for a second, cover some of these icons. So up in the top there, that T is for turbo mode, that tells you the level. So there's low, medium, high, and turbo mode for uh, power for this particular radio. This little icon is telling you that uh, GPS is active because it's uh, red. If it was grayed out, then it's still seeking uh, satellite information. Here's battery information, and then you got the time and date. Uh, this tells analog channel six. So that's kind of irrelevant here, but if you want to map that back to your CPS, you're on channel 324 and you want to change something, that's where it would tell you what channel slot in the CPS program. Uh, and again, there's the channel name and the zone that it's in. Uh, we'll stop on a digital channel in a minute and some of the icons will change a little bit for that. So now I'm in scan mode, so it's scanning channels. Now the interesting thing in this radio, as I mentioned, each channel has its own scan list. So you put together a scan list and I like to make my scan list match up with my zone. So I'll have a Rochester scan list match with the Rochester zone and I attach it to each of these channels so that if I'm on any of these channels and press scan, it'll scan all the channels in this zone. Okay, so here is my ECOM uh, zone, and we could see here's Ontario Racy's on uh, VHF, and there's uh, actually uh, two channels I have there. So what I have done is I've taken a channel that I may have had like Bristol Repeater, and I've renamed it. So I have another channel in my CPS program with a different name in my radio. And that is helpful because if this particular zone wanted a different scan list for ECOM, I would need another channel to associate that ECOM scan list with. And we'll go see later on, I'm going to reuse a channel in a different zone. And so we have to do something different for scan list because it'll otherwise it'll scan the other zone. So what I'm trying to make is that each channel has a scan list. And if you put that channel in, and if you use the convention I do, which is your scan list is tied to your zone, but you want to use that channel in another zone, then the scan list won't match up with that other zone. So the one thing you could do, which is what I did here, is just duplicate that channel and change the name, and then you can have a different scan list with that. But that tends to make a lot of channels and if you're trying to cut down on a number of channels you're programming, you might want a different strategy. So we're going to cover that in a minute. So here I'm covering more channels. There I put the weather in my ecom. Now the weather channel uh, is continually broadcasting. So you have to remember not to add that to your scan list because once you're scanning and your radio locks onto that channel, it probably will never leave. So I le would leave that out of my scan list. So that's where it's helpful where you want to specifically control your scan list for that channel and not just scan every uh, channel in that particular zone because there might be some channels that are continually broadcasting. 
So here I'm channel, now here's my Richmond zone, Tour de Cure, simple analog. Now local, local is a zone I'm, just has a, a different mix of channels in there that I have uh, tend to use more than others. Now you'll see the channel name, that's a silly channel name, it says local scan list. So what I did is for this particular zone, I reused some channels that are in other zones, but I can't reprogram the scan list. So I created a dummy channel and I named it local scan list and I made it the first channel in my zone. And this has the scan list that matches all the channels in this local zone. So when I press scan, it's only going to scan these local channels. So here we could see this Bristol repeater and two NPE. These are all in my other zones. In fact, I think this label over here, Rochester, is the zone that they're tied to. So this is a just a strategy to allow you to have different scan lists associated with the same channels. Now, some of the newer radios, like the 878, I believe, allow uh, three scan lists per channel. So that's where you would want to use that. If you put your channel in three different zones, you could assign different scan lists to each of those uh, zones. So now we're going to touch on, uh, let's see, so we're just scanning through here this roster zone. Okay, so now we're gonna to go to the menu and cover some of the menu items. So here we're going menu zone. So these are the zones in the radio. So if you wanted to out in the field, make some modifications, this is how you would do that. Then this is how you would turn the scan function on or off. And of course we have it set up to our buttons. Here's settings. So this is where a lot of the options occur. So radio settings, we're gonna go down into, so we could turn the beep on and off, the backlight time, uh, light time. So this is uh, time for the, for the screen to be on and then it'll just go off. Key lock, here's the power off in case you wanna set how many minutes before your radio goes inactive. Again, all these features that we're covering, you can set in CPS. You can also set in the radio. There are a few features you can't set in the radio. What's happening more and more now is Anytone is adding new features to the 878 and they're going back and adding some of those features to the 868. But the 868 has less memory than the 878. So while they can add the features to the 868, they can't always allow you to manipulate them on the screen in the field. You can only do that through the CPS program, but at least the benefit is you get those features on the 868, so they are increasing those features. So you can change the level of the uh, volume, main channel. So sub-channel, we're gonna turn on now. This is, before when we were looking at the radio, we only saw one band at a time and we could change between those two bands, but I just changed it so that both bands are gonna be visible. So this is uh, just scrolling down, there's some box things, mic levels you can set. So I just, oh, maybe I shouldn't have jumped that far. Okay, so what I did uh, that was really quick is when you're down in the menu system, up here is the back button, but if you get down, way down in the menu system and you just want to pop up to the very top, just hit the pound sign and that will take you back up to the top layer so you don't have to climb through menus. Okay, so now you can see on the radio there's two bands. So there's the band number A and band B down there and the B band is a little smaller in font size. So I'll be able to receive both transmissions here. If I go to transmit, I'll only be on the 
primary band that I'm on, which is band A right now. And then the left PF short is going to change back and forth between which band. So now we're on the second band. Now we're back to the first band. So that's nice if you want to monitor uh, one station at a time. Now, unfortunately, you can't do any scanning while you're uh, listening to both those bands. Because when you do scanning, it's only going to scan one band and your other band won't be operational. So here we're on RIT zone. So this is a digital channel. So we'll just take a look at the top. The one thing that's changed in the icons is we're on color code zero or one for this particular channel. So there it's listing digital. At the top, I'm on time slot one and I'm in receive mode. So now one of the things we're going to do is go down into the menu system. So the menu system has changed slightly because we're in digital mode. Now we have an item called talk group. We can jump into talk group. Well, we're going to scan through first. There's our zone settings that we already had before. You can do recording of information. There's your GPS for digital mode, your mon digital monitoring. So now we're going to talk groups. I press list, so now we're scrolling down through that list, which is you know three or four hundred channels. Uh, if you want to add some specialty channels, or talk groups, I find it's handy to add them at the end of the list. So then, if you go in at the first slot and you go up one, it puts you at the end of the list, and then you can easily get to the some specialized talk groups that you want to use. Now we'll go back. And we're going to go into manual dial. This is pretty cool. Let's say you're out in the field and you want to talk on a particular talk group and you haven't programmed your radio to do that. So you go to a, a channel on a repeater where you're on the right color code and the right time slot. And now I just want to change the talk group. So I go into manual. I'm going to enter in the talk group number 3100 or 3188. 3188. That's the Colorado talk group. And what I did there really quick, let's go back 10, is you'll see that it's on private call at the top. So we haven't talked about this yet, but a call can be either public or private. Private calls, we really don't use in the ham world. In the business world, if you wanted to just talk to one person, you could make it a private call. Rather than a group call where you have many people uh, participating in, in, the, in the conversation. So we don't use them much in this mode, but the radio comes in default of that. So in order to get out of group, I'm going to press the pound sign after I enter this code. Now I'm pressing the pound sign, and you're going to see the private just talk to talk group ID. Now I hit the press to transmit, and now you can see I'm on the Colorado HD. I just made a call on that. So I changed my talk group on the fly. Now, it'll only stay there for this time. If I change channels, it'll go away. So I'll have to go back and make that manual call again. But once I key up, and if I key into RIT, it's going to be a dynamic talk group, right? For the next 15 minutes, I'll be able to listen on that channel before I have to key up again. As long as I don't change my channel, I'll be able to key up on that. So fortunately, I was downstairs, and I didn't have a good uh, location for it, so I couldn't find the repeater for RIT. So that ends the demo of the radio. So hopefully now we've, we've covered the, uh, some key areas. Rich, we're at yes. the, you've got uh, oh. about uh, 10 or 12 minutes left if you want okay. to wrap it up. Okay. Or take questions. All right. So we're going to jump in the code plug right now uh, and talk a little bit about this. So that, again, is the configuration. You can go out and buy, or not buy, but find code plugs all over the internet for different states. Regions have put them together. And they, uh, they can be difficult sometimes because, again, you're looking through hundreds of channels. So I wrote a program that uh, looks at the CSV files and does some analysis. So 
Uh, this was just running a code plug I got from a friend of mine in California. He lives in Southern California, and they have a large system called the Papa system. So if you're aware of our Megaplex here in Rochester, if you were to put that on steroids, uh, you would get the Papa system. They have about 20 repeaters analog and another dozen or more digital. Of course, they get to put them on top of real mountains like Mount Palomar, which is, you know, 6,000 feet up. So they get great coverage. Uh, so this code plug, 573 channels, is a lot. Now, one of the reasons why I'm interested in code plugs is I'm trying to learn strategy on how to set up zones and channels. And it was difficult. So this program, what it does is it goes through all those channels and it locates the uh, digital repeaters here in this example. And it lists them out. So there's the digital repeater name. Here's the frequencies, the uh, color code. And then I have talk slot, the time slots one and two, and it shows what talk groups are there. So it's a real handy way to kind of print out uh, what is on the radio. So these are all the repeaters, 25 digital repeaters. Here are the analog repeaters that it found. Uh, these are a bunch of channels. So some, some uh, channels were reused and uh, had different names, but they're all going to the same repeater, which isn't really necessary in analog rail because you'll get there the same way. Uh, here it found hotspots. Okay, of course it could find that because digital hotspots, it looks for a digital channel, it looks for the frequency to be simplex, and then it looks for all these talk groups. So these are all the talk groups for this particular hotspot. Uh, these are digital simplex channels that it located. Here's the direct mode. So these are for simplex if you want to do some, you know, point to point communications with different people. And here's analog simplex channels it found. Here's the talk groups that it found. This tells me how many channels are actually using that talk group. So here this test, uh, audio test talk group is used by 92 channels in the code plug. Others aren't used at all. Here's the breakdown on zones. So here's a Blue Ridge zone, and here's all the uh, channels that are talk groups and channels that are in there. And if we just roll to the back, here's scan list breakdown. And uh, so this is just a summary, channels, talk groups, zones, scan list. So it's just a good way to, uh, for me to get an overview of a particular channels. So that's code plugs. So, uh, and this is just what I described as how it was breaking those things down. So, talk about entity relationships a little bit here. So, we have the channel that we talked about, and of course, a zone has a list of channels, and a channel talks to one talk group. And then a channel can be associated with one receive group and one scan list. Of course, if you have an 878, you could get three scan lists. And then each scan list itself is a list of channels, right? And so my strategy here is I keep my list, my scan list, the same channels that are in my zone, so that when I'm in a particular zone, I press scan, it's just going to scan through those. All right. So this is information you're going to need for your program. So you're going to have to go to radioid.net. This is where you would register. So you click on the register page and follow the directions down below and you can get registered. You can go to API and here it's saying, if you're simply looking to download the entire database, click here. If we click on users.csv, this dumps a giant file and this is all those 76,000 or 97,000 uh, people registered on DMR identifiers website. So here it starts with uh, a lot of people in Canada. Here's the California, United States. Here's the name. I'll just scan down. So here's my entry right here, K2AXP. And so this is the file I downloaded, and I have another program that uh, processes this to strip out only the U.S. people. I, so I add all the U.S. and Canadian people into my uh, digital contacts that I upload into my code plug. 
talk groups, we already touched on this website uh, to go get the talk groups earlier. Um, this is the same area. Radio ID is to go to get the digital contacts. Now for repeaters, you could go right to RARA and down here, you can uh, look up information like to help you find repeaters. So there's a lot of repeater areas, uh, websites to go to to find the different repeaters, which is what you're gonna need. So you need all this information before you go into CPS to program. Now we've already touched a little bit on group call and private call. So whenever you're calling a person, either a talk group or a person specifically, because remember a, a, a person's ID, radio ID can be used as a talk group. But we tend to use talk group or group calls for everything. There's just a couple of, one instance of using private call, which is for the parrot system, which we'll touch on shortly. And then there's the all call, which is that special talk group number that we talked about. So here's just a recommended order when you're going into the uh, programmer that you wanna first create your talk groups, either manually enter those or get the list that I'm gonna give to Scott, which will be all the US talk groups. Then you wanna create a channel. Doesn't even have to be a real channel, you just wanna create a channel because when you go to create a scan list, you have to assign it to a, ch a channel to a scan list before you can even save a scan list. But you want the scan list and the receive groups created before you really create channels because when you're on the channel page, you wanna associate a scan list and a receive group. If you don't have them created yet, you're gonna create a channel, then go create the scan list and then have to go back and add it to the channel. And if you just added 20 channels, then you gotta go back to each channel and add it 20 times. So it's important to just create an empty channel or maybe it's, it's one you know you're gonna want. So create one, then create all your scan lists, all your receive groups, just add that one channel to it. Then go to create the channel. And we'll do that in a minute. And then we're gonna add the talk group, the scan list, the receive group, and then you'll be done. Then you go back to the, uh, the zones and uh, add the channels and update your scan list and receive groups. And uh, so you don't have to necessarily create the zone ahead of time, but the scan list and the receive groups you do. So let's go and talk about CPS again. <clears throat> so we're on the screen before, now we're gonna double click on channel four. So here's the details, this is the information in common. So here's your receive frequency transmit, here's your, anal your choice on channel type, analog, digital. There's also choices like analog, digital, transmit on analog. That means it'll receive on analog and digital, but only transmit on analog. Why you would want that, I don't know. That's a feature that maybe the business world used. And the same, you can listen on digital and analog, but only transmit on digital. Rich? Yes. Uh, you need to speed it up a little bit. Uh, we've got a time limit on this, uh, okay? Okay. About 10 minutes more at the most. All right. So. So that's to add there, we talked about zones and scan lists. If you just click on that, just as zones, you can move channels back and forth to configure that. And then when you're all done, make sure you save it to disk and then upload it to your radio. So upload the radio. Now, one of the things when you upload the radio, digital contact list. So because your digital contacts might be rather large, and you're doing a lot of programming, you might not want to update, update your contact list every time you upload your uh, configuration. So you can toggle these to just upload the data itself. So this is just going to upload the data. This is going to go real fast in a few seconds. If I was uploading, you know, 50,000 uh, people, it's going to take a lot longer and slow your way down. Okay, back to our slideshow. So, Covered code plug, analyzer, entities, CPS. All right, so as far as strategies, I've talked a lot about this. Uh, we were doing zones, uh, our really logical groupings like a particular digital repeater or ecom or a particular location where you go to visit and you want to listen to those repeaters in that area. Uh, Channels, you can rename channels or reuse them 
or you can create new duplicate channels and give them different names. If you give them different names, you can give them a different scan list, depending on which zone they're in. I don't use receive groups very often. Again, talk groups, you can just have the ones in your radio you use, or you might want all of them in case you're out in the field and you want to do a, a communication. Uh, so here's some of the Rochester repeaters for DMR. This is Parrot, this is an echo test. So these are some uh, talk groups that are already in the system. So if you uh, transmit on your local, either a hotspot or repeater to that particular talk group with the private call, it'll record uh, about 15, 20 seconds worth of, of uh, voice and then it, uh, it'll play it back for you. There's a couple of other groups, private calls. Here's one, a group call. So don't be surprised if you make a group parrot call and somebody actually responds back to you because since it's a group call, it, it's available to more than one person. So, some hotspots offer some other features, so you would have to check your instructions for your hotspot for that. Okay, so we didn't even get to operations, uh, but we can always, if uh, the demand is there, we can have a, an operation session. Uh, but these are two local uh, groups, uh, Finger Lakes and Monroe County talk groups that are popular. I also have a list of some digital nets. Uh, Monroe County is kind of iffy. Uh, Colorado HD is the place to go. It's usually a couple of hours on Friday night and they have a, a lot of people get on. They have a session like an information session. Somebody will give a, a short like 10 or 15 minute presentation on something. They have club hotspots that they sell, people resell on the net, just like some of our nets here. Uh, they have an open session. You can ask questions and just throw it out. And I'll tell you, the people in Colorado really understand DMR, and they are the experts as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so they are somebody to check out. In fact, there's probably traffic more often on, on this particular talk group than any other out there. Uh, here's a couple of websites from some other digital nets but they're a couple years old, so I can't really uh, vouch for how accurate they are, but it's a good starting place. And then there'll be a couple of links, uh, pages at the end with a ton of links to answer your questions. Okay, so if anyone has some quick questions, I'll take those. Hopefully I covered all your questions. I don't see anything. Uh, all right, great presentation, Rich. Uh, and uh, what firmware version were you using is the question. I think I'm at 2.33. So I'm two, I, I think I'm two firmwares down. I have to get updated. Okay, John, uh, go ahead with your question. NB2K. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Um, I see you've been using uh, Microsoft operating system. Um, there are yes. software available for GNU Linux. I was searching on uh, Synaptic and there doesn't seem to be anything for the distro I'm running here. Yeah, you got me there. I'm not sure if, if CPS runs on Linux. I know it runs on Windows and I'm almost certain it runs on uh, Apple OS. But uh, I guess if it runs on Apple, it's probably a good chance it might run on Linux. I don't know about that. But, but anyway, thank well, you. Thank you. All right. Sorry. <laughs> all right, Rich. Uh, I don't see a lot of thank yous coming uh, on the uh, chat room. Uh, I'm sure you're not watching that, but you're getting a lot of accolades. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Rich, for the time you put in on this. I know we had to cut you a little bit short, uh, but uh, I'm sure well, we got the basics in. Yeah, we they got the, the basics in, and now they know who to contact when they need information. Yeah, <laughs> yeah please contact me. I'm on QRZ, uh, K2AXP, and uh, again, I really want to thank you know uh, Mike and Steve. When I first got my license, and I'm. And I joined Ra Ra the next month and, and that previous September though is when they had their academy for, for the DMR and the D-Star and the Fusion. And I think I watched that video like end to end three times and I got a lot out of there. And then I learned a lot more and I said, boy, I would love to 
you know, work with those guys and give her a presentation. And then they invited me to help them with, with this go around this year. And I'm very thankful for that. I'm happy to contribute to the group. Very good. A uh, couple things. Uh, I want to, this session is being recorded. It'll be available when uh, Brian uh, takes it off his server and gives it to uh, uh, Scott and it'll probably be posted sometime next week. Please be patient. Uh, Scott's running his own business uh, remotely and uh, he updates our website as he has time. Uh, work comes first after family and hobby is third, maybe second, I don't know, third. <laughs> uh, next week or in two weeks, uh, uh, Steve, uh, uh, KA1CNF will be running a, a session like this on uh, Fusion. Uh, again, watch the uh, uh, Rochester website for the uh, registration link uh, to get onto that. I want to thank Brian Duff, uh, WM2M, uh, WM2W, and uh, Tech, uh, True Path Technologies for the use of uh, their business uh, model here. And uh, we'll say 73s to everybody. And Yes. Oh, I just want to throw in, in closing, I just want to share these words with everyone. Only in America is it possible to drive on a parkway and park on a driveway. 73 to all. <laughs> Thank you very much. 73s, guys. We'll see you in two weeks. All right, we'll see you at the Ra Ra meeting, by the way. That's next week. Uh, uh, so look for that on the uh, opening page of the rochesterham.org. Don't want to miss the general meeting. See you guys later. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Great. Brian, you want to close it out?